Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be talking about an art that has been around for centuries. This is the way that people actually pass down their traditions, their stories, and everything that's within their culture. It's simply knowing the art of what is known as storytelling. On our program today, we're going to be discussing how we can go about this by learning Little Hawk's Way of Storytelling, which is the title of the book, and I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program today our guest, Kenneth Little Hawk. Kenneth, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program. Well, thank you for having us, Anna. You bet. Now, tell us about your tradition and how storytelling is part of the thread of life within your culture. Storytelling is... Well, as a tradition, as an oral tradition, it's very old, as you said. And for me, the ideas were given to me by my Mi'kmaq grandmother and Mohawk grandfather by the way of the ancestors' dreams and visions. And uh, the way grandmother and grandfather did it was in an entertaining way of relating values as unselfishness, integrity, honesty, humility, and so much more. And grandfather said, there's food for the stomach and there's food for the spirit. And storytelling helps the spirit to be able to deal with things like integrity, compassion, love, respect. They add these values to develop the character. Now, that's really an important integral part of what it is to be able to bring those values into a person, especially as they're growing up. Uh, Stories are really good about that. And they're, as uh, I said, they're also very entertaining. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many times the animals are used in the stories, and the humor and uh, music and... uh, the songs that are sung during the storytelling makes it uh, almost like a uh, one-person stage act, or not act, but what what is the word, Beverly? My wife is here with me. Uh, We did something at The Hague. What's it called? A uh, one-person show. I pray it's called, yeah, but it's with... Well, anyway, uh, I'm not used to uh, uh, telephone uh, interviews, so I get stuck sometimes. But uh, it's a uh, uh, it's part of what comes out inside of us to relate to people by uh, having it staged. Oh, okay. Now, how long, you've been probably learning and telling stories since you were a child. Yes, I've certainly been learning since I was a child and uh, tried to mimic the elders that were storytellers uh, at the time. And uh, when the children got together, we would uh, try to tell the stories that were told to us. And sometimes we would uh, make up our own stories. Certainly a creative process, isn't it? It is. It's a learning process, and uh, believe me, you make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us about one of the stories that you heard as you were growing up that really kind of stayed with you. It was the story of the apple tree. Grandfather came to me one day, and Grandfather said, you know, trees can talk, eh? So I said, no, Grandfather, I didn't know trees talk. Oh, yeah, trees talk. You come with me. I'm going to show you. So Grandfather took me outside, and in the back of the field, there was a ridge of trees. And in the middle of the ridge of trees that were out front was an apple tree, a very old apple tree. And he said, listen to the apple tree. Tell me what it says to you. And I turned my ear toward the ridge and didn't hear anything. And I told my grandfather, Grandfather, I don't hear anything. He said, Use your heart. So I 
listened with my heart and my ear, and I turned to him and I said, Grandfather, I still didn't hear anything. He said, Then I will tell you what the tree says. And he said he was standing out there the day before, and a man from Europe came by with his family and stopped in front of the tree, reached up, took down apples, gave them to his wife and children, and his wife and he sat underneath the tree, resting, while the children ran around singing in their own language and eating the apples and having a grand time. And after they rested and ate the apples, they got up and they went on their journey. Not long after that, a man from India came by, his wife and children. He stopped in front of the tree and did the same thing. They were dressed in their national garb. The children were running around eating while the parents sat down and rested. And after a while, they all got up and continued on their journey. Not long after that, a man from Africa came by. They were dressed in their national dress, speaking their own language, taking apples from the tree, handing it to the wife and children. And the mother and father sat. And the children ran around the tree, laughing, eating the apples, filling themselves with the sweetness and energy, the juice running down the sides of their mouths. And they were having a grand time. After a while, they all got up and went on their way. Not long after that, a man from China came by with his family. He had his big hat that they wear and his, his clothes that they wear in, in China. And, and the children were running around as he handed the tree, handed the apples to them, and they ate the apples and had a grand time singing in their own language. Mother and father rested, and after a while, they all got up and went on their journey. And grandfather said to me, Do you hear what the tree said? And I said, no, Grandfather. He said, the tree said we must be more like the tree. And I said, more like the tree, Grandfather? Yeah, more like the tree. The tree didn't say, you can't have any of my apples because I don't like the color of your skin. The tree didn't say, you can't have any of my apples because... I don't like the clothes that you wear. The tree didn't say, You can't have any of my apples because I don't like the language you speak or the country you come from. The tree didn't say, You can't have any of my apples. I don't like the songs you sing. You can't have any of my apples because I don't like the God that you follow. The tree didn't say those things. The tree gave freely to all those in need. And the tree said, All that are in need are welcome to my bounty because I have so much. And those of us that have so much should always be willing to give to those in need that have so little. Yes. We need to be more like the tree the tree is telling us. The tree is also saying, I've been here for almost 200 years. Every year, I give year after year after year to all those that come by. Do not turn away from any that are in need. Father said, Now, do you know what the tree is saying? And I said, Yes, Grandfather. Now I know what the tree is saying. Be more like that tree. And as Grandfather always said after he told me the story, he said, That's a good thing you got, Grandpa. <laughs> 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 now, what I really like, too, is, uh, you know, I was the same way. I grew up, I used to go to, uh, you know, summer camps, and, and there were always stories. And the ones that, you know, you really love sitting around the campfire, what could be considered horror stories or scary stories. And I suppose that it was because of those influences early in my life that I began to do the same thing, to be, begin to share and tell stories. And one of the things that you talk about in your book that I that I know is really valuable is uh, knowing to tell the truth in a story, but then to use exaggeration at the same time if you want to do that. But then sometimes even just telling the truth straightforward 
can sound like you're exaggerating or even not telling the truth at all. Tell us about the importance about that. Many times the truth exaggerates itself because there are so many lies that are being told today that the truth is an exaggeration in a field of lies. Right. Uh, using storytelling as a as a guide and also it helps to make people become more aware of the choices that will help them to help each other to help themselves, and also to look at the environment as we do, as a live being, being alive just as we are, and not to look at it as being nature. That's nature, and I'm human. All things Connected. And it helps to teach children the truth so that they will also teach the truth. I don't think that uh, truth can be exaggerated. I think what it can be is a guide using the uh, rabbit story where uh, Gluskop not Gluska. Uh, yes, Gluska. Gluska grabs the rabbit by its small ears as it once had and snatches it up in the air and it, it, its ears got long and never went back. And the reason was because the rabbit told lies to the other animals and had them so excited and, and running into each other and and yelling and, and arguing with each other and nearly coming to physical blows with each other that Blue Scott snatched the rabbit up and its ears got long and the rabbit said, well, if I start telling the truth from now on, will my ears go back, please? No. They will stay like that to remind you that lying can hurt so many people people that have nothing to do with the part that you're telling that is making things so difficult for so many people because the longer a lie lives, more people are affected negatively by it. No, it's a lot easier to cause trouble than it is to fix it. So the exaggeration of the pulling of the ears uh, from its natural size or normal size to the length that they are is an exaggeration, but it's only a, uh, an exclamation point, so to speak, to know that it cannot go back once you've done the harm that you've done. So that will remind you, like, uh, what is it? Uh, I, when I was small, I used to see, uh, oh, I know what it was. Some people would say, you tie a string around your finger so you can remember. Well, that's the same thing, only it's told with rabbit ears. Hmm, interesting. I was just thinking as you were describing that, uh, how enjoyable it is to tell youngsters' stories, how they just sort of sit there mesmerized when you have their attention. And the biggest thing that I remember seeing is the sense of anticipation about what's going to happen next. So pace and tone and timing have a lot to do with a good story, but most importantly, it's how well you can tell it from your heart. You know, uh, okay, my wife was here. I was going to have her say something, but she pointed to something else that I should. Uh, speaking about uh, uh, from the heart, uh, yes, and, and it should all come from the heart. That which doesn't is, uh, is artificial when it comes to the uh, spiritual part of uh, attracting another heart. And 
And uh, what she's pointing to here, my wife Beverly, she's as much of this book as uh, any of myself uh, or uh, Frank. Uh, she wants this, uh, how would it be, is a story. Put the music. And one of the props that I use, uh, so to speak, I don't like the word prop because it's a flute, but it, the story is uh, how would it be, and it goes like this. amazing to think about because I remember as I was growing up, my mother was really good about telling stories when she wanted me to learn certain lessons, you know, it's, uh, and it was quite interesting, you know, this day and age, it's, it's I, I find it intriguing when I hear parents telling their children what they shouldn't do, you know, don't do this, don't go and do that, you know, it's pretty much a black and white rule, so to speak. My mother didn't do that too much as I was growing up. She actually would tell stories. And sometimes I, I keep remembering a story she uh, had told many years ago as I was small, uh, as I was learning to swim. She says, you can be a, uh, you know, a very strong and accomplished swimmer, but sometimes you just don't know. Um, and she gave an example of a friend of hers that actually used to swim out of the ocean a mile a day. And then just one day he simply never came back. <laughs> you know, so I guess the lesson being would be, at least as a kid, I thought to myself, strong summer, you know, what could possibly happen? But the fact is, she says, you know, there's just going to be that time that you may not come back. You just don't know. So it showed me what the possibility of things ending would be. And, you know, you sort of internalize that a little bit. And then at the same time, you begin to accept it. So you kind of figure, well, today's the day that I have. This is the moment that I have to be alive. So you seize that moment. And many times in stories, that's a lot of what you share are the characteristics of what it means to be alive, to deal with not just the good times, but the adversities that you have uh, that, that, that encounter you as well. I think that's a great story that she told you. I really do. And uh, the realistic uh, lesson in it is something that should be told to all children. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. <laughs> now, uh, you've performed in front of more than 3 million people. You've been doing this for more than 25 years as a storyteller, actor, and the like. What's it been like for you as far as when people come up and they say, you know, I'd really love to tell a story like yours, and you finally said, well, get my book. <laughs> uh, let me let my wife answer that, okay? Sure. Uh, Little Hawk is really honored uh, when people come to him and ask him how they, too, can be storytellers. 
the book itself actually has a lo- many, many of his techniques within it, techniques that um, we have um, been so fortunate to learn from other storytellers. Uh, and he, he uses humor, and you heard music. He um, uh, He's also an actor, and so he uses uh, changes in his voice. He uh, also uses many props. And when you were asking earlier about him working with children, he surprises the children. He does things that are very unexpected, and both in terms of what he does. For example, he, he plays a conch shell like a trumpet, and he uh, uses that as well as other items from nature to uh, ask children not to waste, uh, to look for other uses for something before people throw things away. Um, So with those props, the the children are so surprised at the sounds. He uses river rocks for percussion. They're very surprised by what he does. So that's a little bit more of what's actually included in the book in terms of technique. Now that's it's a, a really good point to to be made there because uh, when you consider the element of surprise in a story, I remember there was a time that I was just kind of something off the cuff. There were a couple of friends were sitting in the kitchen, and I brought up you know very quickly tonight there could be a full moon, and this could be one of those moments that will transform us. Before you know it, we'll find ourselves turning into a llama. And they kind of paused, and they said, a llama? See, the fact that I even have their attention on something so short, <laughs> you know, when you say full moon, the first thing your mind goes to is that you might become a werewolf. <laughs> and I said, a llama. And, was, and I love doing that to people sometimes, just going so far off the wall, but that's just seeing if they're following me. But then when you do something so off the wall, it leaves a real lasting impression. And I'm sure you've probably <laughs> done that over the years, haven't you, Ken? <laughs> yes, I have. As a matter of fact, uh, it reminds me of uh, one of the stories about uh, how the turtle got its shell. And uh, in, in part of it, uh, I tell uh, the uh, the landscape I'm I'm reviewing the landscape with the uh, audience of the children. And uh, then I say to them, and in the middle of this very deep, very fast-moving river, there is a, and I, I, I express it with a loud uh, yell and, 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 and gesture with my arms, there is a large, very large, Island in the middle of the river, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that keeps them uh, that keeps them attached to what's going on. It's uh, it's quite interesting too because uh, it's as you talk with people, uh, especially this day and age, uh, one of the conversations that always seems to come up is, uh, "What was your favorite movie that you've seen?" and and and. They'll tell you what they are, and then they'll say to themselves, you know, well, this is why I like that movie was because of this and this. And I said, well, do you ever notice that, well, movies are nothing more than stories? And, you know, the worse the movie is, the more special effects they have to use because they basically lack a good story. (laughs) And a lot of people, I think, they take that for granted, and it's so much fun to actually get out and to enjoy stories. And uh, I know that there was a time when, I was with my son when he did his one week at outdoor school, and I was sort of in charge, if you will, of the boys' cabin uh, as a chaperone, if you will. And the one way I got him to settle down, because, you know, of course, the first night the flashlights are going nuts, you can't get these kids to settle down. It's the first night out at camp is, if I can get you to settle down, I've got a story to tell you. And just by that alone, you know, and 
that first night went off without a kick, and then you know, there I'm telling a story, and then I realized, well, now I've got myself into something because I've got four more nights of this, <laughs> and yeah. which was fine, though. <clears throat> and, in fact, one night I actually said, could I please have a break, and I promise I'm going to have a really good story for you the next night. But the thing is, you couldn't imagine how fast this cabin would just, okay, be quiet. He's got a stride. I mean, we're talking within just moments. And they would stay quiet, but it was also an enjoyable time because with the lights out, the stories that I would tell uh, took tremendous imagination for you to picture <clears throat> exactly what was going on. But it's also about using words, as you said, and symbols. Uh, for instance, as you were talking about, you know, mountains and trees and personifying animals, for instance. And so you can bring in all these elements, and that really ignites the imagination, which is exactly what a story should do. And, and bringing in all the elements that you mentioned reminds me of what my elders said, that all life is dependent on all life. Right. And when my wife and I were up in uh, Nova Scotia, the elder that we were speaking with was telling us, a story about when he was a child and what his elder mentioned to him when he went into his first canoe ride and the elder pulled the canoe to the edge of the water and the little boy got into the canoe and the elder said, Oh, no, not yet. Get out of the canoe and watch me. So the elder went into his pouch and took out some tobacco, spread it in the water, and began singing, and then made a prayer. The little boy said, Why did you do that? The elder said, because the water is alive, just like us. We are a part of nature, not a part from nature. And we must respect all of our environment. So I'm thanking the river because Mother gets the water to quench our thirst, to cook our food, to wash our clothes, we swim in it. We have fun in it. All of these things are what the water does for us. The fish are in the water, and the water in the river holds the fish that feeds us. We must respect that. Now we are going to put the canoe into the water, and it will rest on top of the water, and our weight from our bodies will be in the canoe on top of the water. And we want the water to know that we respect it. That we don't feel that because we are on top of it, that we are better than it. That it is to be disrespected. And the water will take us in the canoe down to the river to see our friends and families that live a long distance away to make our trip comfortable and quick. No. All is dependent on all, and we must respect that. So bringing these elements into the story, like you said, is another way of teaching and showing through the story that we are all connected. There is nothing outside of the circle of life that does not support us, and therefore we should be respectful and supportive of it. Kenneth Little Hawk, you remind me of a story that I had the opportunity uh, where my wife actually put me into an event that we were uh, part of called the uh, Eel Festival. <laughs> of all things, we actually have a festival for eels. And this is uh, in Portland, Oregon. And uh, this was at the uh, shores of the Willamette River. And she says, yeah, I've got you as a shoe in. You're going to be have, going down there and telling a story. And I thought, so, the, you know, the whole week I'm thinking, you know, what am I going to go down and tell? 
I just you know, it didn't come to mind, so I just kind of sat with it for a while. So we're on our way there, and then I thought, oh, I've got an idea. I remember a story that I heard as a uh, child at a at a again a summer camp, but I decided to amend the story and bring in the element of the eels. Uh, as they're called lampreys, so to speak. And I even started my story off, you know, by letting people know that I've heard a lot of stories, I've been around, <clears throat> but this one, I'd never heard the likes before. So there's that anticipation element, like, okay, so what is this? And the other thing is, is bringing in that interconnectedness, this web of life that, that you're describing here, that we're all interconnected, that we all interdepend on each other, everything does. And it was a story, real briefly, it was about a little girl who, through a deep sickness, ended up losing the use of her legs. She literally was paralyzed from the waist down. And that, uh, <clears throat> so here she was, strapped to a wheelchair. She couldn't run and play like she used to be able to. And so eventually, what had happened is one night an owl had come to her window and began telling her, it's time for you to follow me. And this was out into the moonlight across the grass. And I'm actually shortening the story as I'm telling it. Uh, but eventually she came down to a river bank where a raccoon came up and told her to go ahead and simply allow him to put her feet into the water. And the glimmering moonlight across the top of the water, which was sparkly, she began to see these two uh, wiggly lines that were coming toward her. They were almost glowing. And what they eventually did is they were a pair of lampreys, and one attached itself to the large toes on her feet, one on each side. And what they were doing was literally clamping on, and they were drawing out the poison or the bad energy within her legs. And she did this over a course of a couple of nights as the moon was full. And eventually, as she was back at the house the next morning, they were having breakfast, and as mom was bringing over the hot water to pour for tea, she accidentally spilled some of the water onto her feet, and she started screaming in pain. And that really amazed the family because there was no feeling in these legs, but now all of a sudden she was screaming in pain. Then over the course of the next several weeks, little things began to happen as her feet would begin to twitch. <clears throat> and eventually what it came down to is she was then again able to get up, she was able to walk, and then she was eventually able to run. And it was all based on the fact that we should protect the eels because they were able to draw out this bad energy that she had in her legs. And everybody was just sitting there, and it took me probably a good 25 minutes to tell the story, but they were sitting there amazed, and I'm thinking to myself this day and age, you know, I wonder if they ever go to this river and think, as they remember that story, like, I wonder if that's really possible. You know? But the funny part about the whole thing is there was a uh, cameraman who was there, and uh, you know, within about a week or so after we were done with this event, first of all, a friend had called and said, you know, I've seen your husband. He was on this obscure uh, cable channel, and they had filmed him actually telling a story. What was that all about? The next thing you know, I started having friends. You know, just the other night I seen you on this cable channel. You know, so there I was on television, and they were showing a brief snippet of me, standing, you know, sitting there beginning the story that I was beginning to tell. But you know, if you're a good storyteller, you just don't know where it's going to lead you. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. Uh, and and when you started and said uh, that uh, your wife had sort of put you in that position, I can understand that because <laughs> because. My wife, <laughs> would you tell him something about what you put me into? Oh, um, w well, he um, he now is a storyteller for the federal government, targeting what they call diversity inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes in his traditional um, regalia wearing his necklaces and feathers and moccasins, and he brings with him his flutes and drums. And so in the old way of his people, he shares lessons of respect. Uh, and um, I always say that he, he hopes to leave audiences uh, with the knowledge that they can make choices to live in harmony with one another and with the government. Or excuse me, not with the government. <laughs> I don't know if too many that. people that would agree with you this day and age, but we'll go with it. I, <laughs> I, I, I met with the environment with the earth. <laughs> right. 
Jeopardy with the government, too, of course. <laughs> we're, we're stretching we're for wishful birds, thinking, then. I think. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he doesn't expect that. So one time, one of his, um, we, we went to Denver, and he was the, um, he did the keynote for a group of over a thousand judges, attorneys, and other civil rights makers for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So mm. that's the kind of thing he's referring to. He's so surprised. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. And for the one I'm describing, <laughs> he got a standing ovation. Yeah, well, they should be, because what you said was that was a group of attorneys and judges, and they're used to telling stories, but they're not necessarily true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, when they hear the truth, they're, 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 they're thinking to themselves, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> uh, fascinating stuff. The book is Learning Little Hawk's Way of Storytelling, and our guest today, Kenneth Little Hawk. Now, do you have a website people can visit? Uh, KennethLittleHawk.com. That's one of them. He, he has a few. He, uh, TheGoodHeartTribe.com is another. To get the book, um, the publisher is FinhornPress.com. Mm -hmm. Available on Amazon as well. But uh, visit his website, KenneththeLittleHawk.com. Yes, yeah, visit the website, uh, KenneththeLittleHawk.com, and you'll probably find that uh, most of this information, including... Findhorn, H F I N D H O R N Press dot com uh, is uh, is, on uh, is on there also, along with Amazon. Well, very good, Kenneth Littlehawk. Thank you for joining us here on the Beyond Fifty Radio program. It's an art form that should just continue through the ages because it certainly is a a better substitute than just going in and watching a movie and trying to get all your values out of something like that. <laughs> My wife, Daniel, my wife and I are honored to be on your program. And also, you keep up the good work. And any time that uh, we can talk, and uh, even on email, uh, let's do that and uh, keep this uh, uh, relationship alive. Absolutely. Thank you. I feel honored to hear you say that, Kenneth. Kind of thank you very much for being on the program today. You're welcome. Again, it's learning Little Hawk's way of storytelling, a valuable thing that we should all have within us because it's a way that we can expect our spirits as well as express our hearts. I'm Daniel Davis. We thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.